Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in today. I'm Nicole Forbes with Dennis's 7Ds and I'm surrounded by hardy fuchsias and a couple of plants that are complementary uh, landscape plants with hardy fuchsias because today we're talking about attracting hummingbirds to your garden. Um, and uh, although that is a big topic and there are, are a lot of plants that attract hummingbirds to your garden, we're specifically talking about attracting hummingbirds with hardy fuchsias. And so um, to start with, as I usually try to mention at the top of every class, there is a handout that is accompanying this um, with information on growing fuchsias and where would they would grow best in your garden. You can find that handout just below the description or the title of this video. It's a link. If you can't find it, just mention uh, that in a comment and we will be sure to directly link the handout to you. It is um, also important to mention that we are talking here in Portland, Oregon, uh, the Pacific Northwest. It is um, where USDA is on 7B or 8A, depending on what part of the town you're in. And so when we talk about hardy, we mean a plant that is going to be um, able to withstand our average weather conditions summer heat and winter cold and uh, survive from year after year. Now, uh, there are a couple of tricks when it comes to getting hardy fuchsias to survive their first year or two, which is the hardest period for them to become established. And then once established, hardy fuchsias are able to um, withstand basically, you know, like I said, average temperatures within our region. In the ground is where they are going to be hardiest. So that means that planting fuchsias in hanging baskets, planting fuchsias in containers, raised beds, anything that's above ground or out of the ground is going to compromise their winter hardiness and mean that you may need to provide supplemental winter protection and maybe even extreme heat protection um, just because they're up and out of the ground, they, they don't have the insulation of the soil to give them a ev more even temperature and, and um, oh, reduced evaporation loss, that kind of thing. So really, um, just on my table, you can see a reasonable representation of the fuchsia family. Now, um, there are annual fuchsias, I mean, that we treat as annuals in our climate, of course, but not, um, if we were in a warmer climate, they would be hardy in your region. So um, hanging baskets, a lot of the traditional kind of summer shade annuals and shade hanging baskets that we uh, buy and gift around Mother's Day and for the, you know, summer season, a lot of those fuchsias are what we would consider um, non-hardy or annual type fuchsias. Many of those in their hanging baskets are chosen to have a uh, trailing or at least kind of semi-trailing or cascading growth habit so that when they're up in a basket they spill out of the basket and give us uh, the growth out and downward so that we're below the basket looking up. We're kind of looking up at these dangling flowers and a spilling out plant. But fuchsias, uh, the genus fuchsia, has about a thousand species. Is that right? No. Um, a hundred species. Sorry, I was a little excited. Um, more than a hundred species in the genus fuchsia and 2,000 or more cultivars within those species. So the species of fuchsia has a wide range of growth habits of leaf shapes. So just a great example, here we have the very small, fine kind of pointy dark green leaf of, this is hawk's head. So hawk's head is one of our most upright, kind of uh, very vertical upright fuchsias. Hawk's head has a beautiful white flower, kind of unusual for a fuchsia color combination. But hawk's head has this slender, small, leaf that contrasts quite significantly 
with the leaf of something like <clears throat> this hardy variety here, and this is De Bronze Smoky Blue. So between the two, you can see quite a variation, maybe four or five times the leaf size on De, Bron De Bronze Smoky Blue than on Hawkshead. We also see some, oops, we also see some variation in leaf color as well. So uh, De Bronze Smoky Blue has a little bit of a blue-green leaf itself. And then we see something like Golden Herald here, which clearly has a more chartreuse or golden colored leaf, but a good sized leaf compared to, again, Hawkshead, um, one of those larger leafed fuchsias. So habit from even, as I mentioned, hawkshead here, very upright, very vertical. This is a plant that can get two to three feet tall and wide. Uh, so, but a nice bushy plant with that kind of fine foliage. Golden Herald here with the larger leaves can get four to five feet tall and four to six feet wide. So again, even though it doesn't look nearly as upright as the hawk's head now, this is a plant that over time will become um, like a shrub, um, basically proportioned more like a shrub four to five feet than um, a lot of your standard perennials. So probably better towards the back of your perennial bed, for example, if you um, are designing a bed that's got some depth and at four to five feet tall, then your next layer of plants could be in that two to three foot range and still allow a lower uh, border at the edge, be that ground cover or something like low and mounding. Now, growth habit, leaf size and color can range from one fuchsia to another and flowers themselves can range in uh, size color combination and then there are single flowers that are kind of more of a slender tube in the center or there are double flowers and i've got um good examples of size difference here's um this is fuchsia ricartuni one of the smaller flowering uh fuchsia so ricartuni a uh, good size shrub I'll show you the plant here in a minute, but uh, my hands are full of fuchsia flowers. So Rick Artuni, about the perfect size of like an eardrop or an earring. Um, sometimes the fuchsia common name is ladies earrings or ladies eardrops. And then this is Cardinal. So Cardinal is more of a giant fuchsia flower compared to the Rick Artuni flower, although they have almost identical color combinations. Now, the color combination, again, is usually the sepal, which is the outer flared portion of the flower. This is once what was the bud covering before it bloomed. The sepal is what folded up and covered the whole flower up before it opens up. And then the corolla is the inner petal that's usually in a tubular uh, shape and the corolla is often a different color than the sepal itself. In kind of standard fuchsia combos, it's a red or red pink sepal and a purple or kind of fuchsia colored corolla, which is um, really traditional fuchsia colors. A double fuchsia, mm, here it is. A double flower, like City of Portland here, versus back to Cardinal, we have still the same color combinations, that reddish red pink of the sepal, but our Corollas, one is more single and tubular, and then the City of Portland's Corolla is this frilly, dramatic, flared, mass of purple petals in the center. So a double fuchsia versus a single fuchsia, city of Portland, and this is Cardinal. I almost had to look, but Cardinal, city of Portland. <clears throat> so color combinations though aren't always pinky red and purple. Uh, 
especially when it comes to the hanging basket, more annual styles of fuchsias, we do often have quite a range of color combos. Um, I pulled this flower off of one of our hanging basket annual fuchsias just, just to show some of the dramatic color combinations, which really display the different parts easily for us. So again, here is that outer coating, the sepal, and the inner beautiful purple corolla. And before this flower bloomed, it was the sepals that fold up like an envelope and kind of protect that plant, uh, protect the flower. So it's the now sepals that recurve and give us this beautiful blush at the ends and then the beautiful flower inside. Now you can see how tubular these blossoms are, whether they are teeny tiny like with cartoony or our hanging basket annual style. Back to cardinal here. We have a long tubular section behind the petals, behind the sepal that is a perfect shape for the long beak of a hummingbird or the long unrolled proboscis of a butterfly to get in here and get a nice drink of nectar, which provides a ton of energy. There are plants that we call fuchsia or that, are, that have fuchsia in their common name that have a lot of the same characteristics especially blooming wise uh, of true fuchsias and so I have a couple of those with me today also just to clarify when we talk about fuchsia we mean the genus fuchsia um, but you may see other plants referred to as fuchsias and so um, not to confuse you uh, but there's a perennial called Phygelius, and Phygelius starts with the P-H, so P-H-Y-G-E-L-I-U-S. It's not on the handout, which is why I'm spelling. Phygelius is also known as Cape Fuchsia. Now, I believe that that is named after um, Cape Horn in Africa, or the Cape portion, you know, Cape area of Africa, uh, but you can remember it like Superman's Cape, if that helps you. It is not a true fuchsia, Often Cape fuchsias come in um, more um, like hotter colors. So uh, like a raspberry, there's a softer yellow kind of uh, butter yellow. This particular Cape fuchsia is called color burst orange. You see this dangling cluster. So similar to our standard fuchsias, we have a dangling cluster of tubular shaped flowers. This particular one is just this gorgeous orange. It has a flared skirt at the end, similar to our true fuchsias, <clears throat> but it does not have the two parts that are distinct. So this single tube just has recurved petals at the end versus the true fuchsia that has two distinct parts of the flower being the sepal and then the corolla inside. So this is our Phygelius or Cape Fuchsia. Comes in a range of colors, best in sun, super drought tolerant. Hummingbirds also love it, but don't confuse it with true fuchsias. And then the other that is also often orangey, um, a beautiful tubular shaped flower, um, that's usually called the California fuchsia. This is another hot, dry, sun-loving perennial. This is a particular variety called orange carpet. So it's a lower growing form of California fuchsia, but common, excuse me, botanical name on California fuchsia is Zauchinaria, uh, Z-A-U-S-C-H-A. N-E-R-I-A, Zauchinaria. <clears throat> and you can see again, kind of a felted green leaf, quite drought tolerant with this bright orange tubular flower that just kind of appears late summer at the ends of the branches. Also um, just beckoning 
hummingbirds, uh, but not a true fuchsia known as a California fuchsia. Now fuchsia flowers typically fall off on their own um, as they, they kind of self deadhead or self clean, especially the hardy ones. Um, occasionally in your hanging baskets, you will want to remove the spent flowers. If they don't fall off on their own, you want to re remove the spent flowers when this little green knot that's behind the flower. So this little kind of knob here, the flower, once it is pollinated, will fall off. Let's see if I can do this. Sort of. Flower is pollinated, falls off. This little green knob here swells up with seeds inside of it and becomes the fruit um, or seed bearing vessel that will then uh, has the potential to grow another fuchsia. Now I never have seen them sprout new plants in my house um, or in my garden, but the fruits are edible and so birds can eat them as well. They are from one variety to the next. They have kind of a different flavor if you want to taste them all. And um, here on De Bronze Smoky Blue, I can find one that's sort of shriveled up um, and past its prime, so I'm not going to pop it in my mouth or anything. But a, a small, small olive or about the size of a small grape, I suppose. Some fuchsia berries can get as large as a, a, almost a cherry, I guess you would say. And they do have a seed, a couple of seeds inside, but as I mentioned, they kind of, uh, they're edible, although only weird people probably like me eat them. They taste kind of like a cross between a spicy cherry and a grape. It is, uh, fuchsias come from a wide range of native areas as well. So South and Central America, uh, Mexico, New Zealand, and Tahiti. So um, hummingbirds in their native environments probably get to en enjoy lots of variety of fuchsias because there's such a wide range from one to the next. <clears throat> so looking at the fuchsias that I've collected onto my table here today, we are in Lake Oswego. It is uh, September 8th. So late in the season, when it's pre you know when you're talking about perennials we are in officially fall you know into the fall season and these plants are still in um well they're still producing flower buds which means that they're still in their bloom cycle and they will not stop blooming until frost so fuchsias um, begin flowering once it's kind of warmed up a little bit in the spring and could be anywhere from um, late May to early June. They begin their flowering period uh, at that time of the year here in the Portland area and then will continue to flower until frost, which is often mid-November. So you're talking about four or five months of blooming um, on a plant that creates a substantial amount of flowers as well. So this is a plant that can support quite a bit of hummingbird um, energy needs by creating lots of blooms that are nutritious and are refilling themselves constantly with nectar. So here again, this is De Bronze Smoky Blue. De Bronze Smoky Blue is another one of our upright fuchsias, uh, 30 inches tall by 18 inches wide. Could be grown in a container, but remember that you'd need to protect it a little bit in the winter time in a container. De Bronze Smoky Blue, what a gorgeous, gorgeous flower combination that is. <clears throat> and you can see that, you know, what they're talking about with that smoky blue, it's not as purple. Here's our smoky blue again, and here's cardinal. So you can see that the inside of the De Bronze is almost black versus that really kind of sun sh sunset or sunrise shades of that red pink fading to purple into that inner portion of the flower. It is um, a fun contrast from De Bronze Smoky Blue to show some of the small 
fuchsias. So uh, this is David, but there's another really fun one that is very similar looking called Little Giant. David here is one of our great plant picks. So if you're familiar with that program, um, this is one of the fuchsias that's kind of tried and true, recommended for our area as being an outstanding, uh, outstanding and proven plant in the landscape. 30 to 36 inches tall, three feet wide, uh, again, long blooming with these tons of clusters, but tiny, tiny little flowers. So doesn't matter to a hummingbird the size of the flower, they still get um, a great meal and they can visit lots of these blooms really quickly and easily without expending a lot of energy. Now compare David with, we'll go here's Cardinal, also known as Giant Cardinal. So Giant Cardinal shows us those significantly larger flowers than David. We're still looking at a plant that, uh, well, three to eight feet tall. Can you imagine this as over your head, eight feet tall and three to four feet wide? So you could prune this plant annually in spring, and we'll get to that, to keep it probably more to that like three to four foot range. But an unpruned fuchsia, especially something like giant cardinal, could end up, if you don't prune it each spring as it grows, it's gonna regrow onto its previous year's wood and could easily put on that eight feet of height after it had been growing for a couple of years. So the drama of an eight foot tall fuchsia by four feet wide um, with these huge dangling flowers, I can imagine I'd be like, ducking you know hummingbirds as i went walking through my garden with this now another let me see if i can get over here another fun one that is whoa kind of crazy right now on the table so it had to be way over on the corner i showed you the flower of this one little teeny tiny baby so this is ricartuni Ricartuni is one of the hardiest of our uh, hardy fuchsias. And you can see that it wants to be a good sized shrub over time. So right now it's kind of dangling. It would be really pretty on like a wall, cascading over the edge of a wall. But over time, we're gonna see this plant get three to five feet tall and probably about as wide. And down in the center, even though you can see, you know, the edges are really relaxed and floppy and still soft enough to kind of, you know, manipulate and bend. Into the center, we've got a stem that's actually quite woody. So now we've got a stem that wouldn't be flexible. It's got a, even a little bit of bark on it and resembles more of a woody shrub than a herbaceous perennial. So that brings me to what happened to these guys in the winter? So they, so the, what do I do with this plant? So they bloom till frost, right? And, ooh, I should show this one too. So this is Ricartuni, or actually Magellanica aurea. Similar habit and growth of the Ricartuni, but with that chartreuse or golden foliage as well. So sometimes on golden leaves, you could even a little bit of like copper, uh, and then that same beautiful dangling pink and purple combo flower uh, blooms, blooms till frost. A little bit smaller on Magellanica aurea, like mm, five, three to five by three to five. Maybe that's about the same. Um, tolerant of a little bit more shade as well. So any of these golden leafed fuchsias are, um, they can take a half day sun, but I wouldn't put them in the hottest afternoon sun without a little bit of like overhead protection because I think of them as um, less tolerant of that sun and able to burn. So they, they may burn in really hot sun. Um, but that's just the golden leafed ones. So what happens to them in the winter time? Well, if they bloom till frost, then they gotta wrap it up pretty quickly from there. So there's not a lot of fall color that happens once frost hits them. Uh, the hardy fuchsias just begin to die back for the season. Now, dying back just means that their leaves are gonna turn yellow and then brown, and then they're gonna fall off. And once they fall off, you've got a plant that is 
um, sort of a little bit fountain-like, a little bit relaxed because that's their growth habit. But it could be five feet tall in Cardinal's case, it could be eight feet tall, or it may be one of these shorter ones up to, you know, 30 inches or so tall and wide. Those woody sticks that have formed through the season <coughs> are what will remain in place over the winter. You want to avoid the temptation of coming along in November or December after frost and pruning them back. We have seen the hardiness of hardy fuchsias be compromised again by pruning in the fall. It's actually um, the role of some of that above ground woody stem material to protect the the more tender crown of the plant, the spot where it grows from right at the ground, ends up being protected by having some of those sticks above it in the winter time. And so in spring, as we see new growth resume on the fuchsias, little bits of green start on the stems that are above ground and right near the ground level, at that point when spring growth resumes, that's when we recommend pruning your hardy fuchsias by then cutting back any of the dead wood or the frost damaged or, you know, taking your plant down to the size that you want it to start at that season. So after the risk of last frost has passed and once new growth has resumed on the plant. <clears throat> now, we may think of fuchsias mostly as shade plants. And again, that has to do with the hanging basket kind of exposure I think that we've all had of um, the summer annual fuchsias do best with at least morning sun and afternoon shade. They're just not heat loving or able to take and withstand a lot of hot temperatures. But hardy fuchsias prefer light. They prefer full sun. Uh, and at minimum, I would say half day of sun is going to be best for them. In the darkest of shade gardens, uh, you will have a lovely plant with pretty leaves, but very few flowers. So even Golden Herald here, which does best in part shade, is really going to flower, uh, perform for us with minimum of like four hours of sun. So morning sun and then shade from the afternoon, that would be considered part shade for a plant like this. Now, there are a range of fuchsias, as I mentioned, some don't tolerate a lot of heat. So the golden foliage ones typically don't tolerate the hot afternoon sun and the heat of summer. But you will see on the handout, there is a, a, a nice collection of fuchsias, hardy fuchsias that uh, the cultivars are listed on your handout that tolerate more heat than others. So you'll see the Magellanica, what I just showed you, Magellanica aurea, Golden Gate, Prince of Orange, Tom Thumb, Voltaire, which is right, is this Voltaire? Here's Voltaire. So Voltaire is one of our heat tolerant fuchsias with that kind of more pink and pink, I guess, are the flower, com you know, color combinations of Voltaire. Not as much pink and purple or pink and light purple, pink and lavender. Uh, White Knight's Pearl and Winston Churchill. There's more. That's just kind of a, a quick list of some of the more heat tolerant fuchsias. Full sun. What do they want for soil? Pretty average soil. Here again in the Northwest, we have slightly acidic soil. Fuchsias think that that's just great. They want average moisture, so they don't need um, constantly moist soil, but they also don't want to sit in a xeriscape or a you know cactus and succulent garden as well. To get your fuchsia established, if it's newly planted, the best planting times are early spring and fall. So now would be a great time to come see them in their bloom to put them into the ground as our planting, you know, fall planting weather kind of returns. It may be important to mulch or protect them a bit through their first winter, but um, beyond that, you will see a plant that um, lives for many, many years and is a heavy bloomer with low, low maintenance. 
when you plant a hardy fuchsia, one of the things that we recommend is that you go ahead and plant them one to two inches deeper in the ground than they are in their original container. And that is not a common thing that we do. Um, most of the time we have to be very uh, observant of the soil line when we're planting plants and keep that soil line uh, consistent from putting it into its new spot versus where it was growing. And what I mean by that is, come on out of there. <clears throat> we take this plant home today, we see the soil line and where the plant is coming out of the ground. We can go ahead and dig our hole an inch to two inches deeper than this root ball is. And when we end up burying the plant, we're gonna bury it up higher on the crown. Now there's only a few other times that we would do that. Tomato planting is another good example of uh, burying a plant deeper than it normally is in its pot. And you don't wanna do it unless some, you know, you've been recommended to do so. But burying the crown of the fuchsia or even just planting it deep and allowing soil to kind of fill in as it grows over time is gonna sink that crown a little bit deeper down into the soil to give it extra cold protection versus keeping it up into the surface of the soil where it is more vulnerable to extreme temperatures. So burying that crown is one very helpful tip to do. Second, as I mentioned, is not to prune it back in fall, but wait and prune in spring. <clears throat> and um, when we talk about fertilizer, fuchsias do like fertilizer. They are, they are low maintenance. They don't need constant feeding. Uh, wake up like a breakfast. Everybody loves breakfast. So a breakfast for fuchsias as they are uh, breaking dormancy and beginning to grow in spring, that may be March, April, is a great time to fertilize them. And then right about this time of year, uh, since you know July, August, they've still got another September, October, November, three months, you know, to continue to bloom. So a feeding in late July or early August is another good time to feed them. So a wake up and kind of a um, home stretch, you can make it feeding is the best time to fertilize. We recommend an all purpose, just a general fertilizer that's all purpose. All three numbers are the same or very close to the same um, is ideal for fuchsias. You don't need to focus on phosphorus for blooming or anything like that um, and if in its first season you can do that august feeding with a with a fertilizer that is loaded a little bit heavier on potassium that's the last number you may see increased winter hardiness brought on by that um, boost of potassium now um, mulch is the other advantage that you can um, kind of pull the mulch card to give you a little bit of extra winter protection, especially if you're in higher elevations, areas that are more exposed to winter winds, um, more extreme microclimates or pockets where you know that you've lost plants due to cold in the past. Mulching your hardy fuchsia once we've had our hard frost hit, you see the foliage begin to die back, you can uh, mulch around the crown, could be with compost, straw, bark, even fall leaves. Just rake up all of your fall leaves. Um, if they're really big, you're better to run over them a couple times with the lawnmower to shred them up. And then just pile them around the crown. Remember where the crown is? The crown of the fuchsia, just go ahead and pile them over the top of that. And that's gonna be similar to burying them in the ground, not quite as effective, but that's gonna give you that nice kind of protection through the winter months. Size on these guys is, um, you really have to just look at tags. When you're shopping for a hardy fuchsia, I mean, first of all, of course, you look for the flower that um, your heart skips a beat about. And then you've got to pull the tag and be like, whoa, wait, are you a giant? Can I have a giant? Am I looking for a giant or do I need a fuchsia that's going to fit into, you know, the uh, perennial bed with echinaceas and, and lower growing perennials? Size uh, varies from one cultivar to the other. We can have, uh, again, lower growing, I think this is a lower growing, two feet. 
So this is a variety back here called Sharpener's Aurea. It's actually variegated, uh, kind of green and yellow green. Has a tiny, maybe even the tiniest of tiny flowers, um, which is mostly light pink and then just a slightly deeper pink. Sharpeter's Aurea is more of the kind of creeping growth habit. So semi upright, semi trailing or creeping, 30 inches tall, no, 24 inches tall, 18 inches wide. Um, and this one tolerates a little bit more moist soil than your average fuchsia. So some minute preferences um, from one fuchsia to the other, but really biggest is flower shape and size, flower color combo, and then the plant's growth habit, um, how big it's going to get in the long run. There are a few pests that bother fuchsias, um, you know, standard garden pests, which include aphids, spider mites, thrips, white fly, and then uh, one foliar or uh, leaf disease, a fungal problem that fuchsias can encounter is known as rust. Rust is going to um, spot and discolor the leaves and can um, be treated with a fungicide if you really get into a bad rust situation. But pruning away, kind of pruning the dead wood, keeping some airflow on your fuchsia, you know, um, opening it up a little so air flows through the plant as it gets bigger and more mature will help reduce the odds of fungal problems. And then watering in the morning as much as you possibly can to allow the plant uh, to completely dry off, the foliage to dry off throughout the day will also prevent um, the spread and just the, the tendency to create the conditions for rust and other foliar diseases. Fuchsias are, um, as far as, you know, four-legged pests, they're considered significantly deer resistant. So there's an advantage there. Um, what's on me? I have a grasshopper or something crawling up my leg. Uh, whoa, get off. <clears throat> Could have been a spider, just had to do the check, you know. Um, fuchsias are deer resistant and... Um, attract, in addition to hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees. Um, and bees, bumblebees, honeybees, all kinds of bees uh, get all kinds of pollen and nectar from fuchsia flowers. So um, they really have a lot to offer, both for us as well as for our garden wildlife. They don't make the greatest cut flowers, um, and they aren't fragrant. But gosh, they could make you a, a, an edible berry if you're really willing to uh, you know, put in with that. The um, length of bloom time for fuchsias is so significant when we talk about perennials. Um, a, a really, a long blooming perennial might bloom for three months. As I mentioned, fuchsias will bloom often from June until frost, which is November. So sometimes late October, but get off of me. <clears throat> but um, that's five months, maybe even almost six months. So a long, long flowering period. And if we've got June through November, early November covered with hardy fuchsias in your garden, the next plant that'll begin to bloom as these fuchsias are tapering off would be the winter, the fall and winter blooming camellias. Now, um, just to crowd my table and because I love to just grab plants and bring them in for class because it's fun. It's like a scavenger hunt. I over, I have over here um, just a few more plants to extend the bloom season so that if you are looking to have a garden that feeds hummingbirds, you've got your June through November covered. Then with a hardy fuchsia, a hardy winter camellia, um, this is apple blossom. So this beautiful pink and kind of light pale pink combo or pink and white combo. Winter blooming camellias come in a range of colors as well, but this will start blooming towards the end of November. And depending on the variety of camellia could continue flowering into January. So that's November, December, January. The next plant to pick up the torch 
and feed our hummingbirds in our garden after the winter blooming camellias. Okay, let's go back. June through November. November through January. Next we have a red flowering currant. Now red flowering currants are shrubs. <clears throat> they are, um, there are varieties of red, red flowering currant that are native to the Pacific Northwest. I'm showing off King Edward, which is a cultivar, um, but here is the flower of a red flowering currant. It's probably more pink than red, but it is the uh, dangling kind of tubes or clusters similar to fuchsias. They hang down from bare branches, so they're really dramatic, and it blooms before the leaves come out on our little, uh, what am I holding, current, <clears throat> and then the leaves come out. Um, so that is February, March. Then all you've got to do is cover April and May, which is easy. Then our fuchsias start up again. So, or, you know, you could fill a feeder for April and May, I suppose. But you will notice when there's a lot of blooming plants in your garden that the hummingbirds hit the feeder less and less because they're, um, I think they get better nutrition. They probably know they get better nutrition from real live flowers, real nectar versus sugar water. And so only when we see the flowers begin to taper off and stop blooming in our hummingbird garden, do we notice that the hummingbirds start to reliably hit our feeders again. So you could take the summer off on your feeders as long as you've got blooming plants that can supply the necessary energy that your hummingbird population is kind of um, relying on. Hummingbirds have incredible um, memories, basically. I mean, I guess that may not be the right word for it, but um, they know the location in their territory of the gardens that have reliable food sources of where uh, flower, which gardens have flowers blooming in the off months when it's harder to find food. Um, they know that you are thinking of them and that will make them faithful visitors to your garden. I brought in this beautiful panicle hydrangea just because, um, well, they also look great with hardy fuchsias. It's a perfect combination environment of that kind of part sun, part shade, where our panicle hydrangeas can give us uh, kind of that airy flower above a uh, little bit more height to show off the foliage and flowers of our hardy fuchsia slightly lower. This is a vanilla, nope, this is berry white. So berry white's like six to seven feet tall, four to five feet wide, beautiful big shrub that will also flower on through, uh, at least through the end of this month and sometimes even longer. As the blooms age on these uh, plants, they start with kind of a, a white, a pure white, then they fade to pink um, with this kind of apple green tinge. So we see lots of color changes on the panicle hydrangeas as they go through their uh, bloom phase, but they do also just make a complementary foil for hardy fuchsias in the garden. If there are any questions um, after today's class, I will answer them in the comment section. Um, I really hope you learned something today and enjoyed talking about these flowers as much as I do. And as always, thanks for watching. Happy gardening.